Hi folks, thank you for your patience. Sorry for the late start. I'm just gonna take another moment to let people on in. And I'm going to Can you all see my screen yet? Not no. Yet. Yes, How about now? now we can. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. Well, fantastic. Well, let's get started. Um, and thank you very much, folks, for joining us this evening. Uh, hello and welcome to the American Journal of Sexuality Education Lecture Series. I'm Bill Tavener. I'm the chief editor of the journal. And again, thank you for spending some time with us this evening. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce our guest speakers, uh, Dalmacio Flores and Sarah Aboud. Dr. Flores focuses on preventing HIV and STI transmission among sexual minority youth. He, his current research investigates the role of parents in the sexual health education of their adolescent sons who identify as gay, bi, or queer. Dr. Aboud, uh, Dr. Aboud's research focuses on the intersections of ethnicity, sexuality, gender, health, and immigration. Her current research is in particular among Arab youth in Chicago and in Lebanon. Uh, her work is informed by social justice, intersectionality, and health equity frameworks. Together, they are the authors of Hegemonic Masculinity, uh, uh, sorry, During Parent-Child Sex Communication with Sexual Minority Male Adolescents, which appeared in volume 14, issue four of the American Journal of mm -hmm. Sexuality Education, and which is the subject of tonight's lecture. We're going to ask our speakers to speak for about 20 minutes, uh, maybe a little bit long, uh, longer since I got, a, got, got us off to a late start. You have a little bit of leeway. Um, and then we'll open it up for Q&A at the end. So welcome, Dalmacio and Sarah. And if you give me a moment, I will just let more people in who are trying to get in. And then we'll, all right, everybody should be in. And welcome, and the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, and um, whenever you can, we can move to the next slide. Uh, so my name is uh, Sarah Aboud, and I will be co-presenting with Dr. Uh, Dennis Flores about mostly uh, it's his work related to parents' child sexual, uh, sex communication. And I've had the great opportunity to be working with Dennis on, his, on this project and this paper. So um, I will go over some of the introduction, the theoretical framing of this study, and then uh, Dr. Flores will go over uh, the methods and the findings of the study. So um, just a brief introduction uh, about the topic. Children are often socialized into a heter heteronormative culture, one that puts a premium on heterosexuality and usually it reinforces the binary understandings of sexuality and of gender identities. So this heteronormativity, which also is sometimes defined as the mundane everyday ways that heterosexuality is privileged and taken for granted, is socially constructed. And it's also very interconnected with the idea of hegemonic masculinity, uh, which is the enforcement and reinforcement uh, of heterosexual and cisgender identities, again, with a binary understanding of these identities, but also with a hier hierarchical understanding and construction of gender and gender norms around uh, men, women, masculinities, femininities. So hegemonic masculinities are deeply rooted and pervasive in our societies and significantly influence uh, multiple structures that we coexist in such as uh, our understandings of families uh, and family composition, our understanding of uh, marriage and how um, uh, and what that entails as an institution. Same thing around religion. Uh, it also um, uh, dominates different educational systems as well as the laws and policies that we develop and uh, we enforce in our societies. So uh, more recent societal changes in the last few decades around LGBTQ identities have been also accompanied by younger age of coming out and the need for a more inclusive and informed sex communication between parents and sexual minorities. We know from research that has been mostly conducted with uh, heterosexual and cisgender youth 
that communication about sex and sexuality between parents and children, especially during this developmental period, is very crucial in shaping their sexual attitudes and behaviors. However, none of the uh, research, including evidence-based interventions around sexual health, have been ex extended to those sexual minority youth. So knowing, knowing that gender, uh, that gay, bisexual, queer youth are disproportionately at risk for negative sexual health outcomes, as well as other physical mental health outcomes, it is really important to understand their needs, especially around sex communication. Next slide, please. So uh, the study was informed by Bronfen Brenner's bioecological theory, uh, which provides a very comprehensive framework to understanding the multiple factors of the larger ecological system that can influence sex education at home, uh, and sex communication at home. And so the bioecological theory proposes that relationships between an active individual and their active and multi-level ecology constitute the driving force of human development. And so these different factors are uh, the nested set of environment for which the bioecological theory is best known for. And so this study explored how the microsystem, so looking at siblings and peers, the mesosystem, looking at schools and religion, the exosystem, politics and media, and the macrosystem, or the overall cultural and societal context, and uh, how the different factors at these different levels interact among each other and influence parent child and communication. Next slide, please. So um, again, there has been a lot of research that showed that multi-level influences uh, affect the lived experiences of LGBT youth and their health in general. Uh, and this also applies to uh, parent sex uh, communication as well. And so, for example, parents can act as both a source of stress as well as a source of support for, to LGBT youth. For example, parental rejection or lack of support, uh, gender policing at home, especially during childhood, can sometimes lead to adverse health outcomes in adulthood. On the other hand, research has shown that parent, less parental rejection and, uh, for example, uh, more uh, sexuality-specific social support are associated with lower internalized homophobia or psychological distress or even suicidal ideation among LGBT youth. From studies involving specifically heterosexual youth, siblings have also been identified as a source of support and considered as mentors, particularly older siblings who have been serving as a protective function in facilitating uh, some uh, family discussions around safe sex. However, uh, we don't know a lot uh, from previous research the influence of siblings on family discussions about sex among LGBT youth. Peer networks have been identified to have more positive than negative influence on LGBT youth, but still there is negative influence, especially that youth commonly experience, for example, bullying and victimization by their peers at schools, and that leads to deteriorating health and school-related outcomes. However, when there are friends and community support that uh, exist and surround the LGBT youth, uh, these are considered as strong predictors of more positive outcomes. Um, schools uh, around the US uh, and in the last four decades almost have uh, has been, there has been like uh, widespread implementation of school-based sex education programs. However, only eight uh, states uh, in the U.S. mandate instruction to be inclusive of sexual orientation and gender identity. In addition, um, um, few, um, youth, very few youth, especially LGBT youth, um, report that their health classes, for example, had inclusive uh, and, and positive representation of LGBTQ related topics. And this has also been accompanied by the overall school climate being very heteronormative, which creates hostile environment for the, the youth at school. As for religion, sex communication is similarly impacted by specifically those non-accepting principles of major religious groups. So uh, among certain subpopulations of LGBT individuals, the influence of religion, especially through those internalized homo, homo negativity, results in concealing same-sex attractions and conforming to heteronormative behaviors. And lastly, the influence of internet, media, or technology has also shown to provide positive as well as negative 
uh, sources of support. For example, um, uh, due to their inability, for example, to openly discuss their sexual orientation with parents, LGBT adolescents commonly turn to the internet uh, to learn more about themselves and find support and to safely consider the coming out process. However, this does not come without the risk, especially around uh, sexual behaviors. Uh, next slide, please. And so parent-child sex communication is influenced by several direct and indirect components of this larger ecological system beyond the home. Um, the different factors during sex communication are well documented in the literature, but very little is known uh, about the influence of the larger ecological system on parent-child uh, sex communication. In addition, uh, despite the abundance of studies and parenting books on the topic, there is very minimal literature on how to talk about sex with uh, gay, uh, bisexual, and queer sons. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. And so we used to think that there is no parenting manual on how to raise um, queer sons, but fortunately this is no longer the case. Uh, while we may find that alarming, there's actually a good reason for the lack of available resources for parents with LGBTQ children. Um, in a review do that Dr. Flores and uh, his colleagues conducted, they identified that sex communication science is almost exclusively based on heterosexual samples. So as you see in the previous slide, there are multiple resources and books that guide parents through uh, sex communication uh, with uh, heterosexual or assumed or presumed heterosexual kids. Um, and there is really uh, uh, non-existing almost um, research around this parent sex communication uh, with uh, gay, bisexual, or queer kids. So I'll leave the remaining part of the presentation to Dr. Flores. Thank you so much, Dr. Aboud. Um, if we can go ahead and uh, advance the slide, please. So with that very comprehensive uh, review that was provided just now, um, essentially the research aims, um, go ahead and uh, advance please. The main research aim of this study is essentially looking at all of those ecological factors that was noted for general LGBTQ youth and see how it impacts sex communication in the home. Go ahead, please. And one more. There you go. So for this qualitative study, uh, we conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews with 30 gay, bisexual, queer adolescent males who uh, were between 15 to 20 years old. We basically had flyers that we distributed uh, at gay straight alliances, LGBT student centers, uh, and major nonprofit organizations uh, that uh, cater to this population in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, this was, uh, act, the recruitment was actively done uh, from 2015 to early 2016. Next slide, please. Um, and here you'll see uh, how we had the interview guide that assisted us in ha conducting these interviews. I was, I'm sharing this because you'll see that those that are in red is informed by literature that is directly linked to a specific ecological system. And so what we did was we started really from the micro system and then went outwards. But these are questions that essentially frame or uh, seek from our participants exactly how it is the mechanisms that these ecological systems manifest during these discussions at home. Go ahead and uh, next slide, please. Um, we did content analysis for this based on the transcripts of those 30 interviews. Um, and on the paper, you'll see uh, a more in-depth discussion. Uh, here, I just have bullet points of how uh, we conducted content analysis as facilitated by in vivo. Next slide, please. And so who are the 30 participants that we have? Go ahead, Bill. So we had 30 participants, 23 of them uh, identified as gay, five as bi, and two as queer. Go ahead. Um, we had a good mixture of uh, folks in terms of race and ethnicity, um, and you'll see here that breakdown. Go ahead. 
Uh, the mean age of our participants at the time of the interviews were 18.5 years, uh, and majority of them, 26 out of 30, had already shared uh, their or sexual orientation with their parents during the time of the interview. And then one more for this slide. Um, and you'll see here some of the milestones, the sexual identity milestones uh, that were remembered by the participants. So for the most part, the average uh, age for this sample of them realizing that they were attracted to somebody of the same sex was around 10.5 years of age. Uh, the first time that they self-identified themselves and uh, claimed that identity was around 14.7 years of age. And the first time they shared with another individual that they were indeed gay, bi, or queer was when they were 15.4 years of age. Next slide, please. All right, so how exactly does the microsystem, does the ecological system beyond the home affect these conversations at home? So we're gonna parse them out now in the next few slides according to those factors that Dr. Aboud uh, had uh, explained. So in terms of siblings and peers, uh, what our participants said was that their siblings and their peers consistently were a good source of sex information for them prior to hearing about it from their parents. Uh, whether or not these were dedicated conversations about sex or just overhearing about it in the playground or in the school or outside, uh, they, got, they heard snippets about what sex and sexuality was all about from these, from siblings and peers. Um, some of them also received, uh, some, al some also had siblings and peers that, were, that acted as their support system prior to them disclosing to their parents that they were gay. So they were um, practicing, rehearsing with some friends who they were out to about how to potentially share this crucial information with their parents. So in terms of, you know, it was like a dry run for the actual conversation with parents. Um, go ahead and um, next slide, please, or next tab. So here we have a quote from Bentley. Uh, he basically said, I told my brother a couple months prior, and this was prior to coming out. His brother, he's a really good ally. He helped a lot. After disclosure, he called my dad and yelled at him for not reacting better in the beginning. I think it helped that he called and yelled at him for a while. And you'll see here how, as a sibling, you have someone who was able to um, really temper the reaction of parents or assist them or uh, really forcing them to uh, reimagine what a conversation should be like and exerting that pressure. Go ahead, please. Also, another way that siblings um, um, impacted sex communication is that, unfortunately, if a gay, bi, or queer child was younger, their older siblings' developmental milestones triggered group sex talks at home. So imagine if you're like the third son, and then your older, your eldest brother is about ready to go to prom, and the parents decide this is a good time for all of the kids to hear about sex. So while they're really addressing the behavior of an 18-year-old, they're also uh, you know, gathering all of the other siblings, and thus it might not be develop developmentally appropriate for those other members uh, of, the, uh, of the family. Go ahead, please. And then as far as peers are concerned, I'm sorry, can, if we can go back to. And in terms of how peers also impact sex communication at home, uh, they were providing reference points to our participants on how sex communication can occur uh, better. It gave them ideas on how to approach their own parents as well. So, you know, we all come from different homes and we might have that best friend who has the cool mom where you overhear all the time what a, a nice conversation about sexuality sounds like. So it gives you a reference point of, hmm, why is it that my parents don't have these same uh, skill sets? Or why is it that we're different in our household? It gives them a, a point to compare values and attitudes that parents might have. Um, and also for them, as, as stated here, it gives them an, an idea of, okay, if this is how my peers are talking to their parents, maybe I should approach them the same way or take my cue from them. Next slide, please. And then in terms of school-based sex education, the sex talks at home are oftentimes triggered by the required consent forms from the schools prior to them having uh, classes at school. So we'll, we heard a lot of um, instances where uh, one of our participants would come home and say, hey, we're having these talks. Are you permitting me to attend them? And then that would be the trigger for parents to go, oh, yeah, right. I guess you're at that age. Let me sign this. And then, yes, you know, there's a thing called, there's this thing called sex or whatnot. So that provided a trigger for parents. 
uh, because of that form. Uh, and also, and but not quite as consistent, um, there were parental follow-ups after the scheduled sex ed classes. So because parents have had an inkling, some parents had an inkling that this was a topic that was being covered in this week, they made a point to have follow-up discussions when the kids got home and say, what did you learn today? Uh, thinking about, you know, is this something that's congruent with our family values? And then for about half of our sample as well, there was no discussion at all about what might have occurred at school. Go ahead, Bill. So here's a quote from Bentley, still from the same participant earlier. He said, I think they figured, okay, the school's doing it, so I don't need to. And they confirmed that recently because at a baby shower game, they ask all the parents questions like, at what age did you have the sex talk? And my parents were like, never, the school does it for you. So you see here um, an example of how this uh, component of the ecological system does have a direct uh, influence on the uh, occurrence or non-occurrence in this case of sex communication at home. Next slide, please. Go ahead. And then in terms of religion, um, as Dr. Abud had already mentioned, religious affiliation determined topics uh, that, you know, congregants or members of a specific denomination felt was a safe topic to cover or not cover. Um, a lot of our participants also said that sex talks and the topics, unfortunately, were shame oriented, especially those coming from households that really strongly adhered to a specific denomination or a tradition. Um, and also that the content itself of what these conversations were, were, uh, were uh, being taken as um, following doctrine or following whatever it was that is typically preached or um, promulgated in whatever religion that they follow. Uh, go ahead, please. And I have a quote here from Chance. So Chance, when I asked him about that initial sex conversation at home, he said, it lasted really long because she took it way back to the Bible. It was long and hectic. Like you're not supposed to have premarital sex and you're supposed to be married when you have sex. She just kept going on and on and on and on about how guys and girls are supposed to be together and then not guy and guys. And then she was like, and that's how you got here. And actually reading that now, I remember that actually this was, this whole conversation was triggered by the child asking how, um, about human reproduction. And so um, a, a simplistic question about human reproduction triggered for referring back to the Bible. And then you can see here that there's actually a strong undercurrent of um, gender policing that's happening here. So there may be something about this child that triggered for the mom to start putting in values or start putting in standards about who has sex and e even putting, the, uh, putting out the point that it's not guys and guys. So early on, we see already how there's a, a flavoring that's affected by uh, their belief system. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of the polit of politics and current events, uh, no, not surprisingly, whatever is happening in, this, in the news cycle uh, created teachable moments uh, and that they may have direct impact on whether or not a parent will decide, okay, we need to talk about this at home. So at the time that the uh, study was taking place in North Carolina, they were going through uh, Amendment 1 deliberations, and this was prior to same-sex marriage being um, federally recognized. And so there was so, there was so much political conversation about whether Amendment 1 should pass or not. Uh, it was something they saw in the news every day, and this is something that uh, basically uh, some parents took advantage of, and then some families, it was disregarded. Uh, go ahead, please. And here you have a quote from Amber, uh, an exchange we had during the interview. Amber said, who identified as queer, he said, I was 11 or 12 and realizing that I was not straight and then hearing gay marriage being banned in North Carolina. I was like, gay is like a relationship thing? And then I asked my mom, what is gay marriage? Why is it being banned? And she was like, gay marriage is when two men get married. And I was like, that can happen? That sounds amazing. And then I asked him, did you say those things? And Amber said, no. I was like, okay. Like he just internalized like, okay, this is wonderful, but I'm not expressing the wonderfulness of the idea because, because I'm not out or there were so many issues about that. Next slide, please. 
In terms of new media and mobile technology, here there's so many factors. There's so many ways that uh, new media impacted sex communication at home. Uh, for one, with uh, minimal sex communication occurring, this became a source of information uh, for these participants. You know, if you have access to the internet, you can look it up instead of asking your mom or asking your dad. Um, additionally, new media provided ways for these youth to come out to their parents. Go ahead, Bill. And here's a quote, uh, a couple of quotes, actually, a sampling of quotes from six of our participants, because for the most part, six of them told me that at some point they Googled how it is to be gay or what gay people do or how is it, how do gay people have sex. So you see here, and these are the approximate ages that they thought was the time when they looked up these information online. Um, and so you can see here that it really permeates, uh, you know, new media permeates the way that they have access to information. Go ahead, please. And then going up to the macro system, go on. Uh, this is where we see that hegemonic, that masculinity, notions of traditional masculinity really is quite hegemonic. Uh, that sex talks, when they do occur, were framed according to definitions and expectations that parents had associated with masculinity. Uh, these conversations from dads always emphasize uh, toughness, about not being emotional. Um, and we've got multiple uh, examples of kids remembering that father seemed unable to provide guidance because in the first place, providing guidance to children about sexual health uh, was deemed as a mother's job. So even the, you know, the provision or the role of who it is who's responsible for uh, corralling the kids about this important topic was deemed as uh, an issue that women do or mothers do. Next slide, please. Go ahead. And so gender norms were reinforced to sons um, as all of these competing factors were happening uh, as they were growing up um, and essentially hindered sons from disclo disclosing sooner their sexual orientation to their parents. Additionally, um, all of these factors affected parents' capacity to, their, to respond to their sons coming out. Go ahead, please. So, um, here we have a quote, and I, I'm sorry, I can't remember who this came from. Uh, but this participant was saying that the mom, she's always told me, okay, when you're married, you need to find a wife that's this, or your wife needs to do this or be like this. Not just sticking to the whole, you're going to marry a woman, but also sticking to the gender norms of what the woman and the man are supposed to be following. The man is the one that's the breadwinner. He's the one that works. And then the wife stays at home. She takes care of the kids. So here we see that early on in the, um, in the sexual socialization of uh, kids, there's already that gendered uh, bias that's happening at a very early age. Next slide, please. And so all this to say, all of the competing ways that the ecological systems undermine or support uh, inclusivity during sex communication, what our participants were saying is that they are asking for some sort of parental recalibration. The messaging for the most part that they receive from the ecological system as it's manifested when parents talk to their children at home about sex is that, you know, this whole gender binary traditional notion of masculinity. And what, go ahead and press it, please, Bill. Um, what they're asking for, you know, it's like when someday you'll meet your princess. And what they're asking for is, go ahead, Bill. Potentially, can we please include the possibility that I might not meet my princess, but meet a guy who I'm interested with and leave a happily ever after life. Um, go ahead, next, please. And so quickly, we'd like to acknowledge our funding sources and our current institutions. This work was done out of Duke University for my dissertation, and we received funding, uh, both Dr. Abud and I, from the Yale School of Public Health, uh, CIRA. Next, please. I'm being mindful of the time, so. And thank you so much to the American Journal of Sexuality Education. And uh, thank you, and we're ready for questions. Okay, well, thank you so much. And thanks for your patience. I know we had some tech problems uh, initially um, and also some folks who weren't able to get in. So I'm, I apologize for if I was distracted for, for a little bit, I was trying to let people in. Um, I, I know we're a little bit past time, but if our speakers are willing to stick around for a few minutes, oh, it's totally. such an important topic. 
Um, I'd love to open it up for questions and, and ask people to ask their questions directly, uh, not through the chat box. So if you'd like to ask a question, please come on off mute and um, go ahead. Hi, this is Wendy. Thank you so much for your um, sharing your research. Uh, my question is, given that this issue um, is about parents having this um, view of how things should be, do you think we'll be more successful trying to impact parents and changing their perspectives? Or do we need to start with kids and hope that it grows up to change culture from the bottom up, from young age up? Thank um, you. Thank you, Wendy, for that question. Um, I think certainly uh, there's room for both approaches to go and do it through the parents' uh, perspective or working with parents, and then another approach that works with kids. Uh, I love your question because my work in particular focuses on approaching parents to, to get them to start thinking beyond the traditional heteronormative uh, mold that you know they grew up with. Uh, in so many ways, it's not their fault. They were socialized in a different generation. So it's a matter of us as sexuality educators to remind them that, you know, it's not 100% guaranteed that your son is going to find a woman and marry that person. There's a potential for your child to have same-sex attractions. Um, and just putting it out there, not making it such a given that, oh yeah, when you get married to a woman, just putting it out there that, um, there are other possibilities. And so that's the work that I've done since this study is really um, looping in parents and seeing how can we start giving you scripts so that even if your child is not out or even if you have an inkling, but you don't wanna preempt it, how can you provide inclusive messaging so that they won't be afraid or shy to you know, finally come out or help them come out at an early, earlier age so that it's not such a baggage uh, that they have to live with for, for an extended period. But thank you for that, yes. Maybe another question or two? Other people have questions? It's a little hard because parents, you know, as, as I said, uh, have this, there's a traditional notion, but more and more parents are accepting of LGBTQ kids. And we know from data as well that this generation of younger folks are coming out earlier. So that because of the messaging from, because it's being more normalized, um, we're seeing them come out earlier. The flip side of that is the earlier age of self-disclosure, the earlier, the higher the morbidity rates, unfortunately. And so, and that's a different topic altogether, but there's plenty of room for parents to be in that space, to be advocates for the sexual health of their children. Um, you know, if somebody comes out at age 11 or 12 compared to when I came out when I was 30, I mean, it's <laughs> quite a generational shift and lots of ways parents can be helpful there. Come on, everyone, let's have some questions. <laughs> well, I'll fill the space while, oh, I hear someone coming off mute. Did, does someone, want to speak? <laughs> please go yeah. ahead, go ahead. Yeah, um, I guess um, thinking about not just parents, have you seen any data about how grandparents are playing into kids coming out? Because I know, you know, in a lot of families, grandparents and the older aunties and uncles, you know, they have such a huge impact and influence. So have you seen anything along that lines? Um, anecdotally, I think I've had three or four participants mention that. And certainly that is a ripe area for research for somebody out there needing <laughs> a specific research question. We do acknowledge that a lot of households, there are multi-generational households where because you have a different dynamic with your mom, you will go to your favorite auntie because you know she's a safe space. And the question is who is helping auntie when she's not the one who brings the child to the nurse practitioner for the wellness visit. Um, but you know, certainly there's a big role for abuela because abuela is so much cooler uh, to, have, to, to facilitate this because with my mom, no, it's a lot more loaded. It's a more charged dynamic because I guess that's the nature of the mother-child relationship, but it's different for other family, extended family members. Uh, I haven't read any actual article that has come out for this population and extended family members. We have had a couple on heterosexual youth and extended family members, but not LGBTQ teens and aunties and grandmas and cousins. So folks, 
grab it, grab it and claim that research uh, topic. So um, yeah, Frederick, Frederick, please. Oh, I, I'm curious. Uh, so I grew up in Philadelphia in the 70s and there were no options, no choices. I basically had one only way I was supposed to be and that was that. And so in many ways, I wish I could grow up as a child today because my identity, myself, would have been validated from birth or closer on, such as perhaps when you're coming out of 30, maybe you had to do with the, the meso system that you're part of. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious if there has been any studies about the shift uh, today, if there then starts becoming almost peer pressure that you're not cool unless you have explored beyond the hegemonic world for people that maybe actually their identity is part of the hegemonic world. Does that make sense at all? Um, yeah, I think so. So um, hello as well from Philadelphia. I'm in Philly right now. Um, I, it's not a particular focus of my research to see if, there, if peer pressure plays a role in kids trying out or exploring identities beyond being straight. I think that's, that's, my, um, that's my interpretation of your question. Um, certainly that's a train of, that's something that some parents use saying, oh, you've been hanging out with the wrong crowd, which is why you're turning out to be like this. Um, I can't speak with authority on that. What I will say though, going to the topic of parent-child sex communication, parents anecdotally, because this is really a, 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 an emerging field, they have a sense of uh, peer pressure from other parents to discuss uh, or cover essential topics. So if we can get a mass number of parents making it a norm or an expectation for other parents to have inclusive conversation, it can work that way. Um, but in terms of kids exploring or acting on identities that are not heterosexual, I, I can't speak about that. Maybe Dr. Aboud uh, does. Sorry, I'm monopolizing this era. No, I mean, you're the expert in this specific area. Uh, I don't think I have much to add to Frederick's uh, comment or question as well uh, about that specific uh, topic. Thanks. Wouldn't it be nice if we can normalize for all parents that they can say that they have to um, have this conversation, kind of like how it's done in a lot of countries. Uh, the US, as you all know, this crowd in particular has awareness of the hangups that Americans have about sex and sexuality. But in other countries, it's so normalized that it's almost like a brunch topic among parents. And I read this recently of, hey, have you talked to your child yet? They're about to enter middle school you should have done this by now. There's almost a shaming component to some parents if they are like lagging behind on this parenting responsibility. So that's what triggered uh, from Frederick's question about peer pressure. I'm, I'm good. Yes. Oh, Desta, please take the last question. And then I'm, I, I think out of respect for everybody's time, I'm going to need to wrap up, but please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about how, um, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought, um, but that's okay. I think we should just close up. Well, I, I, I apologize. I didn't mean to interrupt your train of thought. That's okay. Um, well, I, I want to say thank you to our speakers and, um, and, and what an important topic for Sex Ed for All Month um, and, and to, keep, to keep that in mind. Uh, there is a question in the, the chat box about if the slides will be available and do you folks have thoughts? Do you want me to deliver them by email? Do you want me to share contact list with you? How, do you not want to share them? Um, no, go ahead and uh, feel free to share uh, the PowerPoint. Okay, I'm happy to send that out to folks after. And if the folks meeting. do want to get in touch with us, um, just Google our names. We didn't put our email address on the PowerPoint, but it's Dalmasio Flores and Sarah Abood. Uh, I'm at Penn Nursing and Sarah's at UIC Nursing. We'd and love to the hear from PowerPoint you. The PowerPoint is really based off of the published article in the American Journal of Sexuality Education. So. Uh, if you, yes, if you can get access to that, you can definitely get more details about the whole study, the background, 
more discussion and implications for future work and contact information as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abu and Dr. Flores. Um, I'm also a little shout out to Mark Schoen. It's, I believe it's his birthday today. Happy birthday, Mark. Um, and birthday. We're, we're working with him to, um, to hopefully put as many of these videos as possible on sexsmartfilms.com. Uh, so uh, I don't know if Mark is on tonight, but um, you know, hopefully we'll find a home for this video at sex at sexsmartfilms.com pretty soon. Um, and uh, so next week we have a we have a session Wednesday next week. The topic is uh, negotiating shame, silence, abstinence, and period sex. Women's shift from harmful, memorable messages about reproductive and sexual health with Valerie, Valerie Rubinsky, Angela Cook Jackson, and Jacqueline uh, Gunning. Uh, so thank you again for joining us joining us this evening, and uh, be well and be safe. Thanks all. Stay safe, everyone. Bye. Take care. Thank you so much.